You know, we priests are something like magicians. Yes, I know. Then you know that if I absolve you, your sins go away. They disappear. They disappear. They disappear. They disappear. Boys Bible Study, and a very happy new year to everyone listening. Um, although I got to admit, I am still, you know, we record these a bit in advance. I am still in my old bedroom, chilling, celebrating Christmas with the folks. But by the time you hear this, it'll be a very happy new year. And more exciting, it's time for January Jalo, which we celebrate every January. Don't know what that is. We're about to introduce a special guest with all the info. But as always, I'm your co-host, Ash, here with Scott. And unfortunately, our co-host, Julian, cannot make it today. He is being pursued by a disembodied hand in a glove, Um, but we trust that he'll be back next week. Our special guest today, the co-founder of Cinematic Void, which hosts film screenings, does a podcast, uh, many things, very involved. I would say like, uh, you know one of the most important entities in the Los Angeles film scene right now. I love what you guys do. Um, our friend Jim Branscombe is here. Welcome, Jim. How you guys doing? Good. Really well. So nice to finally have you on. Um, we had your good buddy and uh, co-host of the Cinematic Void podcast. We had Nick Vance on last year uh, and we love Nick and it was great to talk to him. And we did the movie Shatter Dead with him, um, which is, you know, we obviously cover primarily Christian film. And that was an excuse for us to like get into the outsider film that we love uh, with, you know, sort of focusing on some of the Christian themes. And um, we're excited to do that with you today, Jim, and have you introduce our listeners to uh, Jalo films, which is something that you're a bit of an expert on, I would say. I mean, I might not be the biggest expert, but I do screen a lot of them and I've seen a lot of them. And it's my favorite subgenre and basically... It's I I love these movies because they can encapsulate a lot of things. They can be murder mysteries. They can be occult films. They can be, you know, proto erotic thrillers. There's there's so many things that these films can do. And, you know, they're just made at a time where if you try to make them again, you could not replicate it because one wallpaper has changed Two, yeah. people don't live as decadently as they did in the 70s. Three, drugs were better and, well, basically all that. Yeah. What what makes a giallo, though? Like, I, I feel like I know one when I see it. And obviously, being Italian and from the 70s or early 80s is a big tip off. But um, other than that, like, how would you define these films for someone who maybe hasn't seen them? Well, I'm just going to give you the standard box definition. What usually is considered a giallo is like a murder mystery that came out of Italy, primarily from the mid 60s through the early 70s, which was the first run. Then they would just periodically kind of pop back up, Uh, depending on how familiar you are with how the Italian film industry was. They kind of worked in cycles of genres. That's why you got a big run of spaghetti westerns and James Bond style spy movies. And then of course, Giallo films. And then you eventually had the police films and then cannibal films and zombie films. They all ran in cycles. I'm a huge cannibal Holocaust fan myself. That's like in my top 10 of all time. And a killer score. Oh yeah. Didn't you introduce Nick or finally show Nick cannibal Holocaust for the first time? I did. Yeah. For all of the, the, um, horrible sleazy films he's seen. He actually had never seen that one. So it was my pleasure to watch that with him, um, in my living room. And it was, it was really fun. I legit am very passionate about that film. I think it's beautiful, but you know, Jalo specifically is what cinematic void focuses on in January in your January Jalo series. Um, Scott and I were hoping you would tell our listeners about cinematic void and the many things that you all do and about this uh, screening series that you're about to embark on this month in Los Angeles. Sure. Uh, Cinematic Void was, I started in 2016 in February on Valentine's Day weekend with a very classy 
one two punch of X Ray, aka Hospital Masker, aka the other Valentine's Day slasher, and the Sinful Dwarf, which is one of the best Danish exploitation movies ever made. My original mission was to take kind of underseen like cult films and just screen them and try to build up audiences for them. But you know, after I'm basically coming up on eight years in 2024, I've kind of expanded. I show cult favorites. I'll throw in a you know, a genre hit here and there, but it was basically just showing weird and wild movies. And some movies I really love the champion. Some movies I got to show because I got to make money, you know, (laughs) because if you, if you don't make money screening movies, you don't get the screen movies. That's kind of the golden rule with film programming. Right. And, you know, I basically started that in 2016. Since then, I do online stuff during the pandemic. I was doing virtual screenings where I kind of like took movies and cut them up and added commercials back in. So it was something like USA Up All Night or one of those kind of things. And right now, I also have a, a zine, obviously the podcast that I do with Nick, who I've known for 20 plus years. Uh, what else do I do? Uh, YouTube videos. Man, I'm trying to think of all the shit I do. But you do a my lot of favorite shit. thing. I do a lot of shit and I'm losing track of it. But like my favorite thing I get to do is January Giallo. And I, the first, I actually did it pre cinematic void. I was, uh, working with the DJ crew called rendezvous. That's based down in Los Angeles. And I was doing like audio visual mixes. Well, actually just the visual portion of it. They were doing the audio because they were DJing. And the first time I used the term January Giallo was like for one of their events. And we showed a Giallo film and then I cut out like a Giallo trailer reel or something like that. But the first time I did it for the Cinematheque was at 2017 at the Egyptian Theater. Egyptian, which just has reopened and is very glorious once again. It used to have yes. two theaters within. There's the there was the bigger house and there was a small 80 seater called the Spielberg Theater. Because I guess someone put money and put his name on it or however that works. And that's where I did most of my screenings, like at least the first year of Cinematic Void, give or take a few. But the first January Giallo, I showed three movies. I showed Deep Red, The Night Evelyn Came Out of the Grave, and The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward, all 35 millimeter. And it did really, really well. I think all three screenings sold out there. And then I just kept doing it every other year and just kind of picked up traction from there, as they say. Yeah, that's great. And now you're doing it in other cities, too. It was pretty cool to see in Denver and Boston and Chicago, all over the place. Yeah, I mean, I over the years, I made friends with lots of film programmers across the country. And kind of the first year we were really coming back out of the pandemic, which was 2022, and really doing in theater stuff, I kind of just hit up a few film programmers that I know. It's like, hey, I do this every January. Would you be interested in participating in it? And, you know, I, I don't like to step on other programmers' toes and be like, hey, I got this idea because I hate it when people come to me. It's like, you know what film you should screen kind of thing? Yeah, all right. <laughs> so I, I kind of pitch this like, hey, this is a thing I do every year. Want to see if you're interested. If not, no worries. It's, I don't take any offense. I get it. But everyone's like, yeah, we kind of like this idea. So I think the first year there was maybe – trying to think now i think there was like four venues that participated including mine and then each year after that it's gotten bigger and bigger and now it's like all over the country like as you said denver chicago boston there's a venue in new mexico this year there's two in tennessee the beautiful belcourt theater in nashville central cinema in knoxville and you know there's a lot of places they're doing multiple screenings and there's a few that are doing one-offs too yeah, nationwide. I didn't actually realize the the scope of it. That's amazing. Like, congrats to you for spearheading that because it's such a cool genre of film, and it's it's awesome to see this like new generation of appreciation for it. You know, I mean, it it's kind of worked out because like when I was do- when I started doing it in L.A., it was slowly growing. Like the the first really big year I had for it was 2019, where I did kind of a cheat year. I did Dario Argento versus Brian Palma, which I feel like someone else has had it done way before I have, but <laughs> I, I just like the idea of like, you know, the, the silent feud that Argento and De Palma had with each other for many years. De Palma never really talked about it, but Argento is like, he's definitely seen my shit and he's stealing my shit kind of stuff. <laughs> like the coolest thing I learned from that is like, I ended up doing a Q and a for Nancy Allen. Cause I did a double feature of Tenebrae and Dress to Kill, and she came out for Dress to Kill. And as we're, you know, getting ready to do the Q&A and, like, the, before the credits hit, she's like, hey, so you know, I actually auditioned for Dara Argento's Inferno 
which is like, all right, I knew it. The Palma had oh, to know who the fuck wow. Argento is. Yeah. He was plucking, you think, from the Argento playbook. I mean, there. if you, if if you watch Dress the Kill, specifically Dress the Kill, you'll definitely see it there. I think so. You know, it's I just watched that for the first time a couple of months. It, it was on Criterion. It was featured, so I it came in my radar, and I just watched it for the first time. And I definitely think there's something there. There's uh, there's some uh, some stylistic influence, but what an amazing movie! No, it, Dress the Kill is still phenomenal. Like, I, I actually think the films got better when they when filmmakers get competitive with each other, especially when they're oh, in a yeah. very narrowly specific genre. And what's cool about Giallo specifically is like there's, you know, it's like horror, even though it can be more than horror, but there's all these tropes and they can be subverted in very interesting ways. But there's some some things, you know, you want to hit, you know, you want to hit murder and thrills and like a certain pacing that just feels very exciting. And like, it's really cool to see how different directors interpret that and throw their own you know spin on it. Yeah, I mean, the the basic for at least like the 70s run of Giallo films were like, you know, you had to have murder set pieces, you had to have flashy camera work, you had to have beautiful exotic women in it, you had to have lots of drinking, all the characters are morally gray, if not just kind of awful people, (laughs) and you just throw them all together and just – it. It works because it's like you don't have to relate to anyone in a giallo. You really can't because they're all like, you yeah. know, they're either yeah. artists or they're like just independently wealthy or, you know, they all have insane fucking jobs. Like, it's like, oh, I'm a scientist. And it's like, how? And like the movie <laughs> we're going to talk about, the movie we, we're going to talk about has like two people with the most insane jobs. Especially, well, right. we'll get to it when we get to it, but because <laughs> it's one of the most comical things. It's just like, and there's a lot of like people that are artists. There's a lot of art angles. It's just they're visually set up to be stunning, which is why even when the genre kind of continued in the 80s, 90s and the modern times, like it's the thing where a lot of those films lost when you lose the art and kind of the hedonistic aspects of those films. Which is, you know, rarely there's a lot of people that say I'm influenced by Giallo films. And usually when they say I'm influenced by Giallo films, they just mean Suspiria, which isn't even a Giallo. They just like funky color lighting. Sure. Yeah. Um, You know, I love uh, I I love what you just said about the Giallo genre. And it made me think. So, you know, we are a Christian genre film podcast, uh, which is definitely and we love talking about that. And we love talking about American Christian conservative culture. That being said. I love talking about movies like The Autopsy, which you showed us for this week, because we get to show off that we're actually secretly a cult and outsider film podcast dis- disguised as a Christian <laughs> film podcast. And it's really fun uh, because, you know, compare what you just said about Giallo to the Christian films that we watch every week where the characters are not morally gray whatsoever. They are either, you know morally dark or morally good like that is that is basically with few exceptions what we're working with and not always but frequently uh these characters are supposed to be like very relatable unless they are like legitimately like a demonic entity or an angel or something you know this is someone who is a fireman you know or uh i don't know like it works at a restaurant and it's it's just really cool to see like how the christian movie tropes and the giallo tropes are just so at odds with each other you know? Well, well, I think the main reason is like you got to think that Italy coming out of World War Two or in World War Two is run by a fascist dictatorship. Sure. And them and both them and Spain were like, you know, under fascist regimes. And then once that kind of fascist repressive government kind of subsided, like the exploitation movies that came out of Spain and like Italy are some of the most fucked up and crazy and insane and depraved movies that are ever made. Just because wow. I think they just felt like, wow, we can just like rip our pants off and like go crazy now. Yeah. I mean, because yeah. I get, I mean, I, you know, we can talk about the state of the world, but like, I don't, none of us here have actually lived under a real fascist government. Right. Right. So the fact that like art is now open to do whatever you want, and of course, you're just going to do like, well, what's the things we couldn't do? Sex and violence. Let's go nuts. And, and the other thing is that, you know, Italy's always got the Catholic Church kind of hanging over them because, you know, the Vatican, I guess the Vatican's not technically in Italy. It's its like own place or something like that. I don't know enough. I'm not Catholic, yeah. so. It is in Italy, though. Yeah. 
So you have a lot of filmmakers that are making, you know, genre stuff. They're like dealing with the kind of like Catholic guilt that was forced on them and their use. And like the, the, the movie we're talking about actually is one of the few that kind of takes a positive spin on Catholicism. But not really. It's, you know, it's just arbitrary that it's positive because there's other ones like uh-huh. Lucio Fulci's like Don't Torture Duckling, which is a really damning indictment about the Catholic <laughs> Church and that kind of stuff. And wow. that is one that is one of the great ones and also has one of the great dummy drops that have ever been on film. Oh, my God. I want to watch that. That That's sounds a great awesome. movie. There's a it pretty is. good okay, dummy cool. drop uh, at an important part in this movie, too, though. It looked. Um, uh, th- this one's another. It, if we're going to talk dummy drops, this is the one in autopsy is definitely top 10. Like Italians, when they did dummy drops, they gave no fucks. They just went for broke. Like people like Sergio Martino, I think there's a good grip of Martino movies that end with dummy drops. And it's okay, just well, like, what does, what does that mean? <laughs> a du- so a, a dummy drop is basically as opposed to a person falling off a building or off a cliff, they throw a dummy down. Yeah. OK. And yes. There is a great one in this movie. Then. <laughs> yeah. Uh, the, the, the one in this movie, I, I guess we can just talk about it now since we're already talking about like, yeah. the way it's cross cut between like Mimsy Farmer screaming and the dummy just kind of like flowing down and when it hits it just hits like this just it hits like a fucking like sack of clothes but her whole reaction to it is what kind of sells it and makes that dummy drop come on i'm not the one that's crazy you are let's go see god lennox Oh my God. It's re- really genuinely a powerful moment in a very bizarre film. I haven't watched nearly as many Jalo as you have, but I have seen some in my day. And this one, the autopsy was like at times bewildering, at times like really vital and exciting. Um, so please introduce this film if you don't mind. Uh, what, when, when, you know, we invited you on the show, and I, I believe Scott asked you to pick a film, right? And I'm curious to know why you why you chose this one. I sent a list of maybe three or four films just to kind of meet the um, religious criteria of the podcast. And you guys went with the one where like, you know, there there's a priest in it, but he's <laughs> kind of positive. I guess more positive yeah. than some of the other ones. I mean, but not really. Exactly. We'll get into that. <laughs> but <laughs> I was yeah. pretty I mean, intrigued by the idea of a priest as like buddy detective. That's ultimately why, yes. why I went with that. I mean, you know, the the priest is played by Barry Primus, which I should mention. I screened this movie last year for January Jail, and I showed a, you know, beat the shit, red, faded, like grindhouse print of it. That like, cool. you know, this movie's actually, it's Italian t- titles, Machi Solera, which means sunspots, because that's also pivotal to the movie. But it was released under the victim and corpse and a couple other titles. But the print I had was autopsy, where they just like hard cut in the word autopsy, to let you know you're watching autopsy. Yes. And one of the funniest things about that print is they change a music cue. Now they had the great Ennio Marconi did the score. And if you don't know who Ennio Marconi is, like you, you would know just because just the good, bad and ugly, he did the soundtrack and that's his probably most famous cue. But like during the seventies, he did a lot of Giallo scores and it's some of his best work, but whoever distributed autopsy in America decided like, nah, Marconi's not good enough. So they took a needle drop (laughs) library cue from Johnny Pearson it's a song called Fugitive, which was used as the theme to a TV show called Death Ray. And I remember watching the print. I'm like, what the fuck music cue is this? <laughs> it, it, it's, it's actually it's actually a good cue, but it's like it's clearly not Ennio Marconi. The rest of the movie has all the Marconi, but it's like and it's during like that opening where everyone's like the sunspots are making everyone commit mass suicide. Yeah. And it's like yes. this it's this groovy, funky track. So it changes what? everything. It's like, yeah, <laughs> suicide is like fun. Like that it's like this grooving track of people just fucking killing themselves. And I was like, that's seventies. Ah, <laughs> My first note was crazy opening, great Ennio Morricone score already. Sun yeah, I mean 
I mean, the 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 the, the stock footage of the sunspots and like the actual Morricone score that's in like this version you can see on Shutter or Blu-ray, whatever, is incredible. It's what it's a great eerie kind of like fucked up score. It's like unsettling. So it's weird that I'm w- watching this fucking print and it's just like this funk jam just like going on while everyone's like doing the mass suicide. <laughs> yes. So, you know, obviously this is not one of our typical by Christian for Christian films that we cover on boys Bible study. We are going to use this opportunity to talk about uh, just Jalo in general. Mm. And um, I decided I was going to uh, do with some Sunday school type shit. And I was going to um, inject some Bible verses uh, that were, I found appropriate into our oh, discussion. So on relating to the idea of sunspots, um, psychically controlling the people of Italy into uh, doing things such as suffocating themselves with plastic bags and then jumping into a uh, roaring river. Um, I would like to read um, this verse uh, from the parable of the sower in Mark four verses five and six other seed fell on rocky ground where it did not have much soil and immediately it sprang up. And when the sun rose, it was scorched. And since it had no root, it withered away. Okay, so what he's saying is people who don't have a root in the word of God, they will be scorched. They will be plants that will be scorched by the sun. Okay. Okay. So perhaps. Or shoot themselves with their own machine gun somehow. Exactly. (laughs) Exactly. So perhaps we could really take a stretch here and say that was what, uh, you know, uh, director Armando Crispino was showing in the beginning of autopsy. Probably not, but okay. it, you know, it's a fun theory. He, he took that verse as half metaphor, half literal. Exactly. That's what you're saying. Okay. That's my, Into yeah, it. that's my argument. Yeah. I don't know what his stance or was on for the church or Catholicism, but you know, I, I think that's a fair Bible verse to interject and, you know, gives a new context to it because in a way this movie's all about God's will. Maybe. Yes. Yeah, in a way, but, certainly. Yeah. In, yeah. In the way that, as you said, there's something about the Jalo, the Jalo genre in general that feels very, at times it can feel very like nihilistic almost because as you said earlier, uh, Jim, like the, we're not really supposed to relate to the characters. Um, you know, there might be a hero, there might be people we think are better than others, but people kind of come and go and then get executed or you know, suddenly become the villain and it's all very detached. Yeah. Uh, it's, which which I, I think is very interesting about the genre. It's also very seventies of just going with the flow. It's like, yeah, you're a murderer. Well, if the sex is good and the drugs yeah. are good, we'll, we'll hang out until you try to kill me. Then that's the problem. <laughs> yes. They did a great job setting that up too with that morgue scene. Right after we get that opening suicide montage, then we get a crazy morgue scene that involves uh like corpses having sex and um yes. just a lot of close ups of grossness and kind of just like <laughs> bodies as objects. It it's it kind of predates Reanimator if you think about the ending of Reanimator when all the corpses get up and they're all flailing around and stuff like that, except like than this morgue where it's all in Mimsy Farmer's character's head, which I should mention. Mimsy Farmer is one of my favorite actors that appeared in Giallo movies. I guess her big break was um, more by Barbara Schroeder. And then she just did a lot of European like art house and exploitation films. She's in a couple other Giallos. She was in Dario Argento's Four Flies on Grey Velvet, as well as a movie that Scott actually projected when he was a projectionist for the American Cinematheque called The Perfume of the Lady in Black. And that that was an incredible print. That was um, also a beat the shit print, as I think you put it earlier, except this one was um, IB Technicolor. Uh, So the color was still awesome on it, even though the print was actually in not very good shape. And it had like some water damage and emulsion drip. Um, And also we we were running soft subs on that, which is when you get a print where um, it's in Italian, but there's no subtitles. Uh, so we had wow. like a program set up to separately run digital subtitles over it, which was a good thing because of the way the print was, because of the damage to it. Um, 
it was impossible to keep it at fully in focus. And also the, the soundtrack was like warping in this way that like actually sounded awesome. But probably if I had to like listen to it for what they were saying would have been frustrating. Um, yeah. yeah. So it was a pretty cool, uh, kind of ama- amazing, uh, unique, uh, movie watching experience. And Mimsy Farmer was great in it. She's great in all the, you know, she's great in most everything, but the Giallo film, she's very specific because like, she's kind of like got this like pixie energy and everything, but she does it in different ways. Like her character in perfume is way different than her character in autopsy and four flies and so forth. But her character in this movie, she's a, she works at a morgue. So again, you're getting like, huh, crazy cool job right off the bat. And apparently she's got some, you know, lucid, hallucination problems dealing with repression of corpses <laughs> getting around and like just fucking I guess because the way it implies in the movie is that she's just like I don't want to say virginal but she's kind of scared of sex or her reaction to sex is like she has violent images or something like that so she's deal, dealing with her own repression in a way yeah she's experiencing this sort of like hallucinatory psychosis and I, I feel like the film leaves it open-ended to, is this the sunspots that are acting on people making them crazy? Is she tapped into that uh, energy in some way? Or is this like, you know, a different kind of, yeah, repression that's manifesting and like, you know, a mental health thing. But yeah, the the sex and death link with her um, is making her, uh, it, it's, she's not able to have sex with her boyfriend. Um, she tries several times. Usually it ends up with her screaming. Um, yet when she's at work, she routinely sees visions, which uh, fortunately as the audience, we get to see these visions with her and um, they are of like, yeah, naked cut up people like humping each other and a lot of like surgical nudity and like dead bodies in morgues played as erotic objects rather than like gross out things, which is a very unique perspective for a, for a horror movie. And there's kind of a sex and church connection too, because the one time they show that she is uh, successfully, I guess, having sex and enjoying it. It may make it clear that she's imagining having sex with the priest instead. That's right. That's true. So we should talk about the priest, which is um, played by yes. Barry Primus, who's a great character actor. He was in some early Scorsese stuff. I actually did a Q&A with him for this movie. He showed up, and my understanding is that he does not like this movie. So I already knew where this Q&A was going <laughs> afterwards. But he he was actually fun to talk to. He couldn't remember anything about the production, but his biggest complaint is like, what? when I saw the movie, he's like, what the fuck? I'm a race car driver that became a priest? Like that was his reaction, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> which I mean, ag- I, to be again, fair, <laughs> to, I mean, it's a great career trajectory. You know, you race cars, you find God and you become a priest. It, I, I, it makes sense in the world of the Giallo. You have like one job yes. that's completely unrelated and you get another job. I've noticed there's been a few <laughs> yeah. other Giallos where people start out as race car drivers and they get an accident. So they have to find another line of work. And it's usually like so far removed. It has nothing to do with mechanics. It's like, oh, I was a race car driver. Now I'm an artist, like a right. fine right. artist. Or I'm a fisherman, <laughs> or just anything. Yeah. yeah, I I love that, and yeah, it's I think it's implied in this movie that uh, he was in involved in a, a a fatal accident. After the accident, Paul Lennox stopped racing, went into some kind of nut house. It's a short step from the straitjacket to the dog collar, <laughs> but it's been said no one is closer to God than a loony. He obviously didn't die, but you know some others did at Le Mans, possibly. Yes. Um, honestly, the massacre I'm not going to lie. Some of the plot details. <laughs> Somebody calls it the <laughs> massacre at Le Mans. I was like, are they setting up a prequel here? That sounds great. My favorite thing about talking about Barry, there's two things happened to Q&A. One, he was telling a story about the ending when they go find the, the actual killer in the movie. And he stops and talks to Armando. The director is like, well, how would I know? There's no setup of how to find it. And he said, Armando, stop for a moment. Kind of thought about it and turned to me and said, instinct. That's how you find him. Like, that's yeah. his only direction. I think Barry's a method actor. So he's trying to figure out what's my motivation? How do I find this guy? And the only answer he gives is like right. instinct. Your instinct <laughs> as a race car driving priest is why you can find the killer. Yeah. <laughs> the, yeah. the, other, 
the other thing he did there in Q&A, he turned it on the audience. He's like, all right, guys, why don't you tell me why you like these films? Because I don't get it. And then the crowd actually <laughs> stood up and earnestly explained why they like those movies. I, I don't think it changed <laughs> so his heart. Cool. It, it wasn't quite a Grinch moment, but he kind of re- respected and appreciated people like, you know, sharing their thoughts on it. And he, he signed some all topsy shit after the screening. He, people bought Blu-rays and the soundtrack and he signed it. I think I, cool. I don't think we changed his mind on him liking the movie, but like he definitely didn't remember much of the production. <laughs> when I asked him about Menzi Farmer, she's like, oh, she was a wonderful actor and she was beautiful. But all I could remember was staying at a hotel that didn't have air conditioning. It had the windows and the free it had to get blocks of ice and shit to keep cool because it was really hot. That's his big <laughs> memory for making autopsy. Wow. Nice. Yeah. That's that's really funny though that he like yeah was in this this cult classic Giallo films, but like yeah, doesn't understand the appeal. I think that's charming. I think when he went to Italy, he thought he was going to be in like a Rosalini or a Fellini style movie and right. kind of in a way it is, but also it's not, it's not made for like the art house sect. It's definitely made for the grindhouse sect. Certainly. Yeah, certainly. And, um, Oh, by the way, uh, I did have, um, a Bible verse related to the bodies uh, coming to life in the morgue. Um, that I just wanted to, uh, <clears throat> I have one here. Um, uh, yes, uh, from Isaiah twenty six nineteen, your dead shall live; their bodies shall rise. You who dwell in the dust, awake and sing for joy, uh, for your dew is a dew of light, and the earth will give birth to the dead. Uh, I think that's more of a celebratory thing, uh, having to do with God. You know, um, giving people another life in Christ. I would not say that the reanimated corpses in this movie, they didn't necessarily have a celebratory tone uh, to them being reanimated, but you know, I mean, they were celebrating by procreating or attempting to procreate. I don't know how that works as a corpse. I don't, you know, it's kind of double necrophilia or it doesn't even count as necrophilia if it's dead body on dead body. I don't know how that works. That's 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 a really good point. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we're gonna have to take that up to the the Supreme Court. I'm pretty sure um, to get a ruling <laughs> on that. But speaking of uh, dead bodies, it seemed like so. There's a scene where Mimsy Farmer's character goes to this art gallery, this very twisted art gallery that's run by her father's lover, if I'm not mistaken, and there appears to be giant photographs displayed of real autopsy and gore photos. That is called this production pretty value. Real yes, it is. <laughs> for sure. That was a very surreal and powerful scene. I am. I don't want to say for sure, but I am pretty certain, maybe 99% sure those were real autopsy photos that they had hanging up in there. They gave that vibe to me. And they were big. They were a focal visual point. And that's, that's common. I mean, uh, they do that in Cannibal Holocaust, um, for instance. There is... Uh, a, 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 in the midpoint of the movie, um, we see in Cannibal Holocaust, they show, oh, here's some other, the camera crew is like, here's some other things that we produced. And they show, from my understanding, are like actual like execution photos and like, you know, uh, battlefields photo uh, or videos, I should say. And they're, you know, they're pretty obscure, but you still, and that's that's why the, a lot of exploitation films use this device because it blends the the real and the fantasy and it makes the simulated, uh, sometimes even ridiculous death in a Jalo film feel more vital and real. Um, that's that's my opinion on why, maybe why they did that in, in this film. Yeah, I mean, Italians tended to toe the line of like real violence. You got to think one of the biggest genres that came out of Italy was the Mondo movie, which were all the pseudo documentaries mm-hmm. where there's a lot of stage stuff. I mean, Cannibal Holocaust is pretty much like Ruggiero Diodato's response to those kind of movies because like like yes. Mondo Cane and stuff like that. And like he really hated them and thought they were wrong. And then he made a movie where he used real animal violence because he had to be authentic to them, which is kind of like – you you take one moral high ground and then you jump off that moral high ground right into like the same murk that those guys are in. I love that so much. I don't know why, but that is just so conceptually exciting to me. Yeah, like the idea of responding to an ethical dilemma and in the process creating another just as potent ethical dilemma. It really effectively adds perspective. Like, I mean, it's it's like fucked up. But like when you see something like that, when you see an animal get murdered that you've never thought of like 
you just haven't th- thought of that animal being killed or what that would look like before. It's really shocking. So and, shocking, and yeah. it's like separate from you're so used to seeing like human violence. And then like, that's shocking. I don't know. It's like really like, it's very effective. I still stand by if, if someone watches Campbell Holocaust in this day and age, you're like, eh, didn't really do anything for me. Didn't really, you know, offend me or whatever. I'm just like, the fuck is wrong with you? Yeah, like, absolutely. That, yeah. That movie is still a gut punch. Like, you know, I have a, when I was getting in the cult cinema, I would watch all the fucking shit. So I'd sit through a lot of things that have animal violence as I'm much older. If I know something that has like real animal cruelty on film, I'm skipping it, but I don't deny the power of those movies. Even if I don't agree with them, because you know, I screen a lot of exploitation movies and a lot of giallo films that have very questionable morals up and down, mm-hmm. you know, from the way they treat, you know, just humans in general, but like there's sexism, there's homophobia, there's transphobia. There's a lot of terrible things there in a lot of exploitation movies, but I think they all should exist because they're documents of how people made films and kind of how the world was and really still is. It's kind of a more honest way to look at the world. Cause when you look at how cinema is produced now outside of the Christian community who have their own little bubble of like, Oh, everything's bad except for when God comes in, makes everything good kind of stuff. But like right. I, I look at I look at superhero movies where there's no stakes. Good will always beat evil. And if evil kind of wins, it's only temporarily because a new good's gonna come that's better or whatever. Like nothing fucking happens. Like everything is good. Everything is like morally sound. And I think yes. that's another reason why I like a lot of 70s exploitation movies, not just Giallo in general, is because it was just, it's a real document of just how fucked up the world is. And the world is still fucked up because no one's learned those lessons. But you can go back yes. and see, like, just how how the how the world w- was allowed to be viewed in, as opposed to how you're being shown movies now or how things are being shown to yeah. you now. Yeah. And to your That's point, so too, true. just yeah. how it plays out in autopsy, um, the guy who ends up being the killer in the movie, like, you're like, oh, I, you're a different type of shithead than I thought you were. Because you were obviously a shithead from, like, scene one. Uh, the, the great Ray Lovelock, who's in tons of Italian movies. He's also in one of my favorite zombie movies ever made, The Living Dead of Manchester Morgue. He's just, he's a great, great actor. Um He's just like all he ran the gamut of like exploitation movies, art house movies, just he did it all. And it's like anytime Ray Lovelock kind of shows up, it's like uh, it's like one of those like comfort actors you see in like Italian movies or like all the because he did some Spanish ones, too. But like I I do want to say like the cast of Autopsy, like Mimsy Farmer, Barry Primus, Ray Lovelock, that trio is really great. And they have a great dynamic for their weird love triangle however that works <laughs> yeah yeah and they're all just very, they're very competent giallo actors who bring a lot of unique character to the piece um, I mean, sometimes in spite of the very convoluted plot that's probably my biggest criticism of the film <laughs> i mean that was barry primus's biggest criticism of the film <laughs> yeah. like, what is going on what is going on here I mean, the, I guess the other way is like giallos do, or not just giallo films, but like a lot of exploitation 70s stuff. They sometimes the, in order that you get a really smart idea and then you maybe get a little too lost in that ether and autopsy, you definitely can get a little lost, but I think like the performances are great in it. And yeah, there's times it just doesn't make sense, but it's like, you know, life doesn't make sense. You just kind of go with the flow. Yes. Yeah, again, that's not why we're here. I mean, again, it, it as the director said to Barry Primus, instinct. The movie's about instinct. The instinct is that it just goes fucking insane. Yeah. I yeah, mean, if you really think does, about it, yeah. they don't really like spell out the sun. They talk about the sunspot stuff, but like they don't really lean so heavy into it that it, it's just kind of a background noise for a lot of it. It's like, oh, spot, the sunspots are making people go crazy and stuff, but it's just like, then as the movie mo- moves on, it's like, eh, not as important anymore. Yeah. Right. And yeah, the idea of these sunspots, you know, uh, causing people to go mad and and kill themselves and, you know, there's all this mass suicide and crime and stuff like that. That basically then becomes like an excuse for 
a certain nefarious actor who, you know, we're trying to figure that out the whole movie, who that is, uh, to actually um, execute a series of strategic murders that have to do, uh, we learn throughout the course of the film, something about uh, like a will and inheritance and being left out of an inheritance. There's, there's withholding of certain important documents. Yeah, um, I mean that's a that's a very Giallo MacGuffin reason to like. Oh, uh, I'm doing this because I'm not getting the money I should get. So once I kill these certain people, I will get that money. That I mean, it's a it's a classic Giallo trope. It's like you know someone inherits money, but then they die, and you're figuring out well, why they died, who benefits from it, kind of thing. And honestly, and I don't want to spoil it because, or do we do spoilers? I don't know. Yes, Where we, we go? do. Yeah, we're okay. we're gonna we're gonna conclude with the yeah the spoil of this movie. Okay, that that's fine. We'll we'll save yeah. it to when we get to there. But like, okay. basically, w- when you find out who the killer is and you get his like half hearted thing, it's like I was left out of the will, and he's all pouty about it. It's like, do you have to kill people to do that? Couldn't yeah. you just hire? <laughs> couldn't you just hire a lawyer? I, obviously, you have the money because you're just like fucking around. It doesn't look like you have a real job. So it's not like you're yeah. broke <laughs> or at least do both. Yeah. That's just good business these days. That's true. You know, you, you could benefit like, you know, that's the side hustle, the murders, they get more money. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You get this, the murders and economy, the lawyers, you know? Yeah. It, yeah. It, it, we live in a gig economy and apparently in yeah. 1970s Italy, the gig was either you have some weird non job that somehow you can live lavishly. And then, when you don't have enough, you just kill the right person just to get that little extra like pocket change or spending money. You know, Christmas is coming kind of thing. Exactly. And I mean, speaking of like the reveal of this film, I, I'd say let's do it. Anyone listening who really doesn't want to know, um, I would suggest you at this point watch the film first. I will say to me, the appeal of this film for the reasons we've been describing goes well beyond the plot. And I think uh, even knowing this fact um, will not ruin someone's enjoyment going through this film for the first time because it's it's really well done and really lurid and fun. But um, I think it's safe to say that at, at the end of the film, it's revealed that uh, Mimsy Farmer, uh, her, her character's name is is uh Simona Simona and uh she has this yeah the shithead boyfriend who just seems like an ally the whole time even though he does things like you know try to rape her and other you know other things like that puts on a Um, porn film to try to get her in the mood kind of stuff he he, it's like if this was a sex comedy he would be the bully like high school boy or college boyfriend that's trying to force his underage girlfriend into sex like this is right. that, that guy's that trope. Yeah. Like he's just exactly. he's a scumbag. And it's like Ray Lovelock is likable because he's just a likable person in real life. So that you have this likable guy playing a totally just absolute fucking jerk off of a human being yeah. that, you know, you can't really be surprised that he's the killer and has such a whiny fucking, you know, reason for doing it. Yeah, it's it's revealed that he is the killer. And, um, you know, this is, this is sort of a big surprise, but also sort of not. Um, but you know, he's, uh, because there's many, there's many, you know, suspicious actors in the film, even the priest, uh, you know, who we obviously, you know, we at boys Bible study are, are going to be rooting for him, but he's in a morally gray area too. There's that random scene where he comes in and says like, I've killed many people before and I'll do it again or something. And you're like, what's going on with this guy? He's just fucking (laughs) angry is what he is. It's like for the guy that's supposed to be the hero that like Mimsy Farmer's character has like a brief fantasy of so she can like, you know, have sex with Ray Lovelock. It's just like he's kind of just a fucking asshole the whole movie. And he has like those pills, which I don't know if they're anxiety or they're like you know, trucker speed. I don't know what those pills are. Yeah. Antipsychotic pills or something like that. They don't seem to do anything. They might be <laughs> placebos at this point, which kind of brings us up to before the climax where like him and her are naked on the floor because he, you know, Ray Lovelock did that like paralysis poison thing to him. And he's like crawling along trying to get to his pills and he breaks that shit, the bottle open with his teeth and he's like just chewing them <laughs> just to have enough energy to get up or whatever. That, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's a really intense scene, but it's also like this shit's fucking what is going on? here? Yeah, that part was great. I was 
very excited to see that for the first time. Somebody breaking open a pill jar with their mouth and their mouth bleeding as they're like chewing up the <laughs> yeah. pill off the floor. I oh, mean, so it, whatever's in those pills, I guess it's like spinach, the like Popeye or something like that. Because he just <laughs> yeah. gets up and it's also probably what gave him the instinct to find Ray Lovelock hand, hanging out on top of a building just right. randomly. And he's like, there he is, like just fucking barely driving down the street. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I guess that boyfriend character, it, to what you were saying about people just having these jobs, like jobs that if you pulled like some fourth graders and asked them what they wanted to do, they would be like race car driver or uh, he's a photographer, <laughs> I believe is, I don't know if that's his job or just like his passion or whatever. But yeah, he, we've seen him a couple times in the film, like. You know, just trying to take photos of architecture, basically. And that seems to be how he spends most of his time. So they do end up finding him, yeah, like on top of a building trying to get the perfect shot. And then he becomes the perfect shot. Mm-hmm. Yes. Or or the perfect series of shots. Like you yes. get that you get that fight on top of the roof between Barry Primus and Ray Lovelock, and like it's it's a pretty good bit of fisticuffs there. It is. I thought that scene was very exciting, actually. That was one of my favorite scenes. There's such an energy to it. And it's it's like one of the things about Giallo films in general is like they either are like high energy or they just like hit like they just become a slog. They're like a lot of Giallos, like especially the lesser ones, like the, the highs are high and the lows are lows. I think with Autopsy, even when it gets middling or very exposition driven, there's still enough weird shit going on that will carry you on to the next scene or whatever, <laughs> whatever information you need to get. There's something weird that's going to come up right before, or right after it. So it's like it's not too dense, even though it's it's about like a hundred and some minutes. So it's it's I guess to some people might feel a little long, but I, I think it just kind of flows nicely. And just like every time it's like, ah, they're talking. I don't fucking care because they just seem to be having a conversation that's not un, it's not going to be related or pay off at any point. But, you know, it just moves on. Then, like, you know, there's a shotgun attached to something that blows a dummy's head off for whatever reason. That was a lot of dummies, like good looking dummies that they set up for like a two minute scene. Look, that yeah. that again, production value. Absolutely. Lots, lots to look at. Yes. And, and, and to what you were saying about like plot and like how yeah even the the more convoluted that the thing i said before and i i stand by this that the film plot wise gets really convoluted i'm very good i'm a very listen i'm good at staring at a television and watching a movie okay but there were times i was like who is this lady in the wig why is she wearing the same wig as the other lady like there was shit like that that was very very unclear (laughs) to me um but even when that was happening i was extremely entertained like from beginning to end of this film. I was I was wrapped with attention, I would say. Um, so I consider that a huge success and I would I would definitely recommend this film. And again, it closes with an epic dummy drop. And you know, yeah. you don't you don't you don't get the um the you know Simona and Father Paul Lennox kind of rolling off to the sunset thing. You kind of get the ambiguous, you know, maybe they will find a life together or She'll just take Ray Lovelock's body back to the morgue and just start cutting it up and have some more crazy fucking visions. Yeah. You know, Scott, so so Jim wouldn't know this uh, reference just because I'm, I'm guessing he hasn't seen this film. But God damn, what, what was the name of that crazy fucking demon movie with the woman and the priest? It was another like woman priest like buddy uh, cop film. It was the, the contemporary film that had insane visual effects. Oh, the one that just came out uh, like within the past yeah. year. Uh, yes. D- um, shoot, that's a Catholic one too. The devil, the devil conspiracy. The devil conspiracy, yeah. right? Yeah, that was maybe. It, although the the tone of the films are completely different, I would not at all call the devil conspiracy a, a contemporary Jallo, but <laughs> it was still about like a woman, you know, female protagonist teams up with a sort of rogue priest um in the devil conspiracy this is actually like a priest who got killed and was arose from the dead so now he's 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 still a priest but he has like powers and ethics that go beyond human life so he's a bit more rogue and um it's them teaming up there's no like romantic aspect to it necessarily maybe more so in this film there's like a sexual tension if only because literally every male character tries to rape uh mimsy farmer um the priest is probably the most 
kind to her of any of the characters in the film. So um, maybe it's only for that reason I'm inferring like a sexual tension because it was oh, established throughout they're, the whole film. I mean, the whole movie's just sexual tension. Like she has sexual, I, I guess because like he's maybe because of the godliness behind him. That's the yeah. the thing she needs for the arousal where like Ray, Ray Lovelock's character is obviously godless. Let's right. be real. <laughs> It's like the, the fact the fact that he has all the time in the world to shoot fucking photos of architecture and kill people. Like obviously God is low priority. Maybe she just needed someone who could speak to God or lived on a higher plane. That's what did it for. Her. That that's what's missing. And and you know, he's I guess he's relatively nice to her. He's still kind of an asshole to her. I guess he's but because he's not grabby and trying to like user for sex like every other fucking male in the movie that's what gives him the you know the hmm maybe this guy right yes there's okay. just that moment where he's shaking her saying i am a priest show me some respect <laughs> i am a priest <laughs> <laughs> yes my name is paul so what you might have some trouble changing their minds after the massacre at Le Mans, where'd you go you haven't been passing yourself off as a priest for very long have you i am a priest you hear me? I am a priest. Why don't you try and show me some respect? You hear me? Show me some respect! Okay, so I'm glad you brought up the fact that we live in a godless society as symbolized by these, this in this case, mid-70s Jalo film, but even truer today, right? I think we can all agree that God has, for the most part, left the people of this world. They have no interest. Um, you know, they are... We're, we're, we're animals now. That's just how it goes. So Scott and I chatted a little bit on the phone earlier today. And Scott, I, I wanted to bring up what, what we were talking about, about how just like how, okay. We at Boys Bible Study had an, a really fun experience earlier this year where we brought the word of God to American Cinematheque and to the Los Angeles underground film scene. We screened, yes. we did a repertory screening of Let There Be Light one of the most godly contemporary films there ever was with, you know, modern day Saint Kevin Sorbo at the helm. And, you know, we promoted this and American Cinematheque put us on and was so kind and, and so generous with their time and helped us put on the show much passion from the Cinematheque crew. So I'm certainly not, there's, there's the spirit of God is running through that theater. Okay. I'm, <laughs> I'm not blaming them, but we posted this online and I mean, the response we got, it was like, it was like Jesus casting out a demon. I mean, there was, there was gnashing of teeth from some of the yes. comments we were getting, calling us fascists, uh, saying that, you know, they, that why is Cinematech platforming this, this evil message? And Scott, you know, brought up a very interesting point. To, I, I'll, I'll let you like continue <laughs> this thought, Scott, but about sure. how movies such as this one are received, uh, uh, the autopsy are received as opposed to a Christian film. Yes. I'm, I'm curious, Jim, what's the harshest reaction you've ever heard you've ever gotten from a movie? Because I, I, the thing I was thinking about as I was reading these com these comments, um, claiming that we were, uh, Nazis straight up for programming, yeah. let there be like, that word was um, used. <laughs> yes. Um, I was thinking about, um, running the movie, Jim, was it Patrick or Patrick still lives? Patrick yeah. still lives. Yes. The, yeah. the Italian knockoff of the Australian movie, Patrick. Right. Patrick still lives. And I was, I couldn't help but thinking about repeatedly um, staring into, I, I almost don't want to say it on the podcast, what I was staring into, uh, waiting for the cue to like change over. <laughs> the the the, but, the infamous fire poker scene from Patrick Still Lives. Let's just leave it at that. Right. The the less people know, probably the better. But <laughs> if you're asking like why certain things cause outrage, it it just it's the zeitgeist because like you know Kevin Sorbo because his outward politics and all that, you know no one. The thing is, it's like repertory cinema across the country shows movies by problematic people all the time. Right. Just flat out, you know, you know, maybe right now Woody Allen films aren't getting played, but like there's probably some place that's still playing them. You know, everyone's mad at Roman Plansky and I'm not trying to make light or like belittle like the horrible thing he did, but 
you know, people will say things about how terrible he is, but then you show Chinatown, it fucking sells out. Yeah. It's it's an arbitrary thing because it comes down to what people consider art and what people consider just exploitation. And it's an interesting dynamic because, like, I should say, like, when you guys did your screening, we didn't pay anyone. Like, the the people that own that movie, and I'm talking on behalf of the Cinematheque, when we booked it, they just sent a Blu-ray and said, cool, screen it. That was it. Wow. So See, and that's no, such a Christian no, mentality, you know, so giving. And yeah, it's just like, and I'm a, the thing is they didn't make a profit of it. I mean, people could say like you gave him a platform or gave that film a platform, but it's just like you, the thing is anytime you're screaming a film or st- screen uh, screening, not or streaming or whatever, you know, you're platforming something. And like, just because you show art, art is not basic, you know, showing something is not endorsing it. You know, right. you're not, you know, you're not endorsing Kevin Sorbo as this great, you know, human being, you're right. showing a movie and you're kind of showing the godliness of it. And you're also kind of taking the piss out of it kind of thing. Right. You know, people still do screenings of the room. You know, Tommy Wiseau is apparently not a really nice person, but, you know, people will still go and throw fucking spoons at the screen. <laughs> you know, it, um, you know I, yeah, uh, I'm just segueing here, but I was thinking during one scene in autopsy that um, you got to start handing out forks. Like like oh, yeah. how they do with the room and spoons when uh, Mimsy Farmer attacks the uh, morgue creep with a fork is uh, pretty good. Uh, well, it's fucking great because like she doesn't hold back. I think she stabbed that dude with a fucking fork. Yeah, wow. like for real. Like there, oh. he might have had a pad, but like no, nah, he's he's taking those fork jabs like dead on. Because like the fear in his eyes. Like either that is the b- best acting ever, or he's just getting stabbed by a fork because he probably <laughs> did something really scummy and she was taking it out on him, which is a possibility. Yeah, it's possible point. given given what I saw. I mean, there are very good actors in this piece, but that did feel very real. But um, yeah, I just wanted to uh, you know uh, conclude your thought about you know um, the you know obviously a gray area nature of art and platforms and you know what art deserves to be seen the reasons for watching it and i want to add on top of what you're saying while i completely agree with what you said um you know i believe in one god and jesus is his son and i renounce the evil filth of january jallo <laughs> i will do everything in my power to prevent the screening series from happening wow. And um, that's just my my mission now. I'm 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 declaring that here on Boys Bible Study, a holy war, you could say, um, sort of a Christian jihad on American Cinematheque and um, all of all it represents. Ash, although oh. um, whenever you decide, I will support you in full. I just I think I need to remind yeah. you that Jim did screen uh, the Lindsay Lohan movie. I know who killed me for last year's <sighs> January Giala. So he is God's messenger. Yes. yes. <laughs> so he is a servant of the Lord. I see now. So I'm going to say about that. So a lot of people like there's a lot of people say they make you know, the modern Giallo or American Giallo films. And yeah. wh- I think one of the best examples of it, especially in the last like 20 years, is I Know Who Killed Me. It it fucking yes. textbook Giallo. Uh, Chris Severson, who's the director of the movie, came out to the screen. Actually, he came last year. He was just coming out to all the January Giallo screens because he saw that I Know Who Killed Me was playing with, you know, autopsy and a lizard and a woman's skin. And he's like, that's fucking cool. I need to meet the guy that's doing this. And like every screening, I was just basically singing the praises like this is one of my favorite American Giallos. And it's one of the few films that kind of understands the genre and all of its tropes and plays it out in a very modern context, at least the modern context of 2008, 2009, whenever the movie came out. Yes. And, you know, sitting there talking about it, I'm like, uh, the thing is, like, I think the problem with a lot of people that try to make Giallo films now is they miss, like, kind of the convoluted plot theory or just, like, just yes. the weird shit and the character arcs and, like, Everyone kind of being a terrible human being. You try to make someone like morally grounded or sound in a Giallo film. It just doesn't work. Right. It just yes. takes away from it. Whereas I know it killed me like everyone's got some 
skeletons in their closet. There's like twists, there's <laughs> turns, there's the shock of like, you know, I don't want to rule in a frame when it hasn't seen it. Like definitely see, I know who killed me. Yes, also, 100%. you have not, you have not lived until you're in a sold out theater watching. I know who killed me where Lindsay Lohan kind of almost turns the screen and breaks the fourth wall. She doesn't quite do it, but it's very close. She says, I know who killed me. <laughs> fucking that's so brought great the, brought the goddamn house down it was the it it, 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 it it was like you know I, i'll never probably see a great miracle by jesus at any point that's the closest <laughs> i'll get that 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 yes. is actually witnessing a miracle and because i got to be part of that i have ascended to heaven and your jihad against january giallo is void <laughs> no, I complete. I've got to say, after learning what I just learned, I now completely renounce my jihad. I see that although your path is twisted, it um, it is the path toward righteousness, and I am grateful for your platforming of Lindsay Lohan and that fantastic film, which I watched with Scott a long time ago, and we had a great time. Um, Scott showed me that film for the first time, uh, and it's it's a masterpiece. So I love your comparison that that is really like the heir of the Jalo genre because i think that's dead on well i mean think about it think of Lindsay lohan's character she's like if this was made in the 70s and obviously you have to take out a lot some of the modern aspects of the movie but if it was made in the 70s and like it was edward fennick and sergio martino as the director or carol baker and berto Lindsay making it and did pretty much not the exact plot but a similar plot it'd be a giallo classic like yes. i think the, the thread line is just so clear there and that's what a lot of people miss when they try to make Giallo films. They they want the visuals, but they really need the fucking bonkers ass plot because the bonker ass plot is what gets you to the murder set pieces, the mysteries, the sex, the violence, all that stuff that makes a Giallo a great Giallo. You need the fucking insane fucking plot to get there. And most people just try to put like a normal movie plot and then have some like you know, black gloves and some fancy lights. That shit doesn't work. Exactly. You need to be, you need to be fully committed to the insanity. Yes. Agreed. Yeah. Beyond yeah. pastiche above yeah. pastiche. Right. To your earlier point, everybody just loves the, the aesthetic of Suspiria and tries to do that. Um, but in like a modern way, that is not actually how they did it in the first place. I was going to say about Suspiria, like the thing that people seem to miss about Suspiria is Terry Argento wanted to do Snow White. So all the, the color mm. palette of Suspiria is fucking Walt Disney's Snow White. He said it a million fucking times at this point. Wow. Interesting. Now think about that. I uh, Another modern American Jallo that I just rewatched recently was the 2006 Black Christmas. That one's actually a really nasty movie. Like, yeah, I know it was. I mean, wasn't the the. It was a, uh, I forget off the top of my head, but weren't they like some of the guys that made it? They used to write for the X Files, and I think they did one of the Final Destination movies. That was sounds it two great. or one? Was it two? Or, I, I, I'm just pulling this out of my head. My memory's so bad, but it's something like that. But that movie, like, you know, if you disconnect it from like the history of what Black Christmas the original is, the 2006 is just a mean, lean, just nasty, just brutal movie. Yeah, it needs a Giallo title. It needs like a long, like the boy who died and came back with the eyes or something like that. <laughs> it's like <laughs> the sharpened candy cane always strikes on Christmas Eve or something like that. Or yeah. no, no, you need like the bloodstained candy cane or something like that. You, you, it needs a Giallo title. Like, I guess probably putting the yeah. X instead of doing Christmas and doing Xmas kind of like dates it infinitely and just kind of. That's where the luster gets lost on it. But like, yeah, I think if it has a Giallo title and like even, you know, Giallo, there are Christmas Giallo films. They're very rare. Actually, one of the most famous Giallo films actually has a subplot that deals with Christmas, which is Deep Red by Dario Argento. Oh, yeah. Oh, I haven't seen that one. There's a heavy Christmas element. I mean, it, it's right in the beginning of the movie. There's the Christmas tie in mm. and it's very integral to the plot. So... If you want a giallo film that you can throw on, you know, Christmas time and that kind of stuff, Deep Red is the one because there, there's a Christmas the tree. There's some presents on the ground. There's definitely a murder involved. So, yeah, Christmas giallo. Well, as we have learned, mm -hmm. um, the spirit of the giallo is alive and well in this day and age. And so is that Christian sense of giving that 
brings us to the movies here at Boys Bible Study. But what did we think of Autopsy? So, you know, this is a a true Jalo film, not quite a Christian film, but one that we loved because it it brought in some fun Christian elements. What do we think as Boys Bible Study co-hosts, our guest today, Jim? What is the official Boys Bible Study review of Autopsy? I really enjoyed this movie. I, I liked the avant-garde editing. I thought that Ennio Morricone score was um, as good as any he's done. Uh, really went from like dissonant tones to like some groovy bass lines, like at a moment's notice, which really captured the vibe of uh, people's head spaces in this movie. Um, whole thing looked great. I'm going to have to give this 10 out of 10 horny corpses at the morgue. Uh, perfect Ooh. movie. Uh, we'll be watching again. I completely concur. Um, this was a masterpiece of the mid seventies Jalo, and um, you know this is my first time seeing the work of Armando Crispino, but I will be watching more. And um, yeah, I, I really like this. I mean, I love a priest who's in charge and the moral arbiter. You know, even if he does pop maybe a few too many pills, you know, he was still the hero at the end of the day. So that makes me happy as a Christian film podcaster. I've got to give this film three out of three dummy drops, okay? Because I just learned what that was, and this film's got one of the greatest dummy drops I've ever personally seen. So shout-outs to Autopsy. You know, I I have to agree with you guys. I, I think even for Giallo standards, this is one of the best the genre has to offer it's got all the things you need it has sex it has violence it has dummy drops or a really great dummy drop it has sunspot stock footage where i don't even know where you get that from but yeah this is really a perfect movie i'm gonna give it one angry barry primus who doesn't like this movie out of one (laughs) because it's just one and done (laughs) one race car driver out of one priest (laughs) (laughs) yeah no, this was a really special one, and and thank you so much, Jim, for for recommending this to us. This was it was a blast getting to to talk about it with you. Oh, it was my pleasure to you know bring the giallo to the more secular realm of cinema. Yeah, no, for real, it was it was a blast, and um, so yeah, you know, we talked about Cinematic Void, and of course the January giallo screenings that are going to be happening all through this month here in Los Angeles. Uh, can you please tell anyone listening who wants to learn more? Can you tell them where to go? So if you're in the Los Angeles area, I have a uh, weekly residency at the Los Feels 3 through the American Cinematheque. I screen movies every Monday and for the month of January, I'll be showing Giallo films every Monday. Uh, I'll be kicking things off with a great, great title and another maybe – not so religious movie called Your Vice is a Locked Room and Only I Have the Key. Uh, one of the things I do want to mention is that on January 20th, I'll be returning to the Egyptian theater where I used to do my screenings for a very special screening of Torso and The Strange Vice of Mrs. Ward. And I'm going to have director Sergio Martino. He's coming over from Italy. Wow. He's going to be here wow. in person. So he's so that that that's probably the biggest thing I've ever done for J- January Giallo is to bring an actual you know, Giallo filmmaker from the prime heyday over here and that's awesome. talk about his great body of work. That's no, that's so cool. amazing. Congrats. I'm going to try to be there for that. And if you're in the Chicago area, he will also be at the Music Box Theater on that Monday, the 22nd as well. Music Box in Chicago is doing January Giallo on Mondays. The Coolidge out in Brookline, Massachusetts, which is pretty much near Boston, kind of like Brookline's a weird town. It's kind of like interweaved in Boston, but it's its own thing. It's a really great art house theater. They're doing Midnight January Giallo. I'm also going to be in Salem, Massachusetts. I'm actually flying out the first week of January. I'm going to be at Cinema Salem on the 5th, showing Jerry Argento's opera. And then I'll be jumping over to Brookline at the Coolidge and hosting their screening of Deep Red on the 6th. No way. That's awesome, dude. Congrats on these upcoming screenings. And I hope that... Uh, anyone listening, if you're if you're in those cities that Jim just mentioned, like get a ticket now as soon as you can before it sells out, and meet him there. And well, you know, we'll all watch some great Jalo films this month. And um, yeah, thank you, Jim, again for for joining us on the show. It was a blast. Uh, thank you guys for having me. It's 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 a pleasure to be 
you know, ushered into the other side, the, yeah. the more godly side yeah. of cinema where I, I usually <laughs> dwell dwell where the the shadows work. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, it's you're welcome here anytime. Just uh just say the word. And um for uh, our business here on the Boys Bible Study side of things, we would like to thank everyone for listening. If it's your first time here, you know, maybe you're a cinematic void fan and you're listening because Jim's on, please go to boysbiblestudy.com and check out all of our free episodes throughout the years. If you really like what we do and want to support our show and get more content, patreon.com slash boys Bible study is where you can pledge to unlock all of our bonus episodes. Um, special shout outs to our patron saints, the the patrons at our $20 tier. We shout them out on every episode. Thank you again, Jeff, Marissa, Mark, Nicole, and Rhett's always a blessing. And our outro music is the song, Oh My God by Mary. So from all of us here at Boys Bible Study, myself, Ash, my co-host, Scott and Julian, our guest today, Jim Branscombe, we would like to say, peace be with you. And also with you. Forgive me, Father, for I have sinned. I feel your love in me, it's coming from within. Oh my God. My devotion is so unwavering. Divine emotions when you enter me. Every day.